Okay, so first of all, thanks everyone for um, having us. Uh, as the title suggests, obviously I'm going to be talking about archaeological databases, and in particular I'm going to be talking about something called the Archaeological Recording Kit, or ARC. Has anyone heard of ARC at all? Oh, quite a few people. Um, that's lucky, because we have been working on it for about 15 years, so at least some people have heard of it. Um, and I know there's already been some uh, um, talks in this conference from Historic England and also the ADS about uh, repositories and that kind of thing. Uh, and so what we want to do is kind of join into that debate but by presenting a way perhaps for people to actually record data in the field uh, before they go into the repositories, basically. Um, <coughs> And specifically, um, we wanted to talk about these databases which are focusing on archaeological fieldwork uh, and the post-excavation process as well. ARC does deal with all sorts of other things, but we're going to be concentrating a little bit here on actual fieldwork and recording in the field uh, and how that might, how things have changed over the last few years and then how that might develop into the future. So... Um, the reason we're talking about it now and saying this 10 years is that in 2007, um, Guy and I presented a paper on ARC at the Computer Applications uh, in Archaeology Conference in Berlin. Um, and we kind of used that to introduce some of the ideas that ARC has at its core and some of the concepts. Um, <coughs> so what we wanted to do is do a kind of retrospective, basically, and see how the last 10 years of the internet and parallel developments in software and hardware and everything, how that's actually changed field archaeological recording um, and how that's changed what we have to do with our databases and everything online now. So since 2007, a lot has, a lot has obviously changed. Um, some things have stayed the same. <laughs> this guy and me back in 2007 in Berlin before we had kids and while we still had some hair, so that's quite good. <laughs> And actually, when we were talking in, in CIA in 2007, we, the kind of uh, paper was about our sort of thoughts and ambitions. And actually, that talk has actually stood the test of time quite well, um, barring possibly the graphic design of the slides. But I have interspersed some of those old slides. I managed to resurrect the old PowerPoint from all those years ago. So see if you can spot which ones they are. Um, just, a quick, just a quick introduction to what ARC is. Um, and who we are. So as um, Victoria said, we're from LP Archaeology. We're a standard commercial archaeology company, um, RO, etc., etc., etc. But we have a, a specialism, I guess, in digital archaeology as well. So we do a lot of work with databases and websites and GIS and that type of thing. Um, <coughs> the kind of key members in ARC are all listed as um, authors on the paper, so I won't go through everyone. Um, but what I would say is that it's, it's quite a collaborative effort, so it's an open source project, so it's not just people in LP Archaeology who work on it. We also have a GitHub where people contribute to and everything as well. The original objective of ARC is that we will be able to work with all kinds of archaeological data, so that's fieldwork records from dig to publication, that's also field surveys, so mapping, uh, metal detector surveys, field walking, etc., etc. Uh, finds databases and also monument and event records as well, so going down the sort of road of uh, HERs and that type of thing. So it's designed to be flexible to deal with a lot of, a lot of different scenarios for us. Uh, as I say, the software is and always has been free and open source and ready to download, so if anyone's interested they can go to our GitHub and download it. I suggest you wait until the middle of the summer because we're about to release the new version, so um, might not want to download the old one at the moment. Um, it's a released on a GPL3 license, if that means anything to anybody. Um, it basically means you can do with it whatever you like as long as you uh, attribute where you've got the code from. Um, <clears throat> the system can hold written records, plans and maps, photographs, basically all types of digital data. Um, and it can also be used throughout the whole um, the whole of the life of that data as well, all the way from initial recording all the way through to getting it ready for publication. Uh, so it's very much designed from the point of view of data capture, but also from data sharing. So what Victoria was talking about there, about actually getting this stuff out there online 
as you're going. Um, and we've got a slide here which shows some of the projects which are using it. Some of you may have heard of that project in the top left, Prescott Street, got a, few, a bit of traction a few years ago. So that was one of, an early, one of the early examples of ARC online being used in the commercial archaeology environment, um, where we published all of our data as we were going along, and then also used that to, to kind of um, have people doing blog posts and all of that type of thing as well, all linked back directly to the data. Uh, more recent project on the bottom right here, this 100 Minerys project, this kind of dark one at the bottom there. Um, that's doing something similar to Prescott Street as well, uh, currently ongoing and going into the post X stage at the moment. Uh, we've also got Waterloo uncovered up there, that's the excavations at the battlefield of Waterloo, um, which is charity work. Uh, it's also used for Fasti Online, which is basically a European sites and monuments record of sites from the classical period. We're going to, it's going to become the back end of a thing called DIME, which is the Danish equivalent of the Portable Antiquities Scheme, and also it's the engine behind the Dig Ventures digital dig team, which I'm sure some of you have heard of as well. Um, so it's currently in use in a lot of different diverse ways. So, oh, here's a slide from 2007, I haven't changed that. Uh, <laughs> so in, the, in 2007 we really kind of set out what the core tenets of what we wanted ARC to be were flexible, reflexive, open so that's both open source but also open data so there's nothing to hide there basically once you put it in then you can release it immediately obviously if you want to uh, and hypertextual and one of the big things for us as a commercial unit is that we wanted it to be able to deal with and reflect the kind of hybrid paper digital nature of archaeology. So obviously one of the big problems, well, problems, one of the big things at the moment in UK archaeology is that pretty much everyone records on paper or on permatrace, which we have to, and then goes into the museum and museums or repositories won't necessarily accept purely born digital data, which having worked on tablets in a, in a horrible you know, British winter, it's probably quite a good idea that we're using permatrace actually. Um, so what we needed to really do is make a system that can work very well, fit into that paradigm, basically, that hybrid paper digital paradigm, and then how we might get things from the paper to the, to the um, database as easily and quickly as possible. And then the flexible aspect of it is that, again, from a commercial point of view, not all units use the same recording system, right? I mean, we all say we do, but obviously we don't. Some people have trench trench sheet, some people will do multi-context planning, some people will go full on kind of Museum of London urban stratigraphy type of thing. So these databases for, e for each um, particular unit or even each particular person have to be quite flexible. What we don't want, what we didn't want to do is kind of impose a this is how you do recording. We wanted to make sure that everyone could customise the recording um, themselves basically. Uh, and then also well, back in 2007, obviously, everything was about reflexivity and post-processualism, etc., etc., so we threw that in, too. I mean, I still believe in it. I don't know if anyone else does, but anyway. So, so it's, it's, got, it's like a wiki-type thing. It records all of the edits, and, and you can look at all of the other revisions, etc. Just a couple of... Oh, there's another one from 2007. So just a couple of um, sort of techie bits about how it works, basically. Uh, we sort of atomize the recorded data into the smallest possible units. So in this case, um, the bit in the middle is called an item. So that's a context in this case. That could be a, a plan or a photo or whatever it is. And then basically you just use post-it notes effectively to post little bits to your, to your item. So, you know, what we've got in action was excavated on a date, etc., etc. It's all kind of relatively simple stuff nowadays, actually. Um, and then these items can all be linked together in non-hierarchical ways. So you can see there that item, that context also has a photo and a sample attached to it, which also has a, each one of those has a bunch of digital post-it notes attached as well. And then that follows through into the post-excavation stage if you want it to, where you can easily group and subgroup or do your land use or whatever it is, um, pulling all of these different items together, basically creating another item and then linking more things to that. 
kind of um, relatively relatively straightforward, really. Uh, but bringing on, coming on from that, we sort of wanted to talk about how things have changed over the last ten years and how that's really impacted what we do with online data and and also practice in the field. So, obviously, in two thousand and seven, the Nokia three three ten thirty three ten. Um, pretty much every. In fact, I've, I've still got one. Almost, almost like that. that's kind of retro, rather than being <laughs> head of the head of the class. Um, so, phone phone uh, hardware was very very different, obviously. And in fact, the concept of the smartphone was only really just coming out. No one would have thought that in ten years' time you could have a supercomputer in your pocket. Or well, maybe some people did, but certainly not as uh, ubiquitous as it is now. Um, so. Back then, we weren't even really thinking about how you would how you would deal with that or how that would become kind of standard. Uh, and then the other thing is is the use of mobile data as well. So back in two thousand and seven, mobile data was so completely expensive, and you basically didn't get anything. Whereas now, you know, data access is kind of ubiquitous. It's fast. It's relatively cheap. Obviously, I mean, it's not free. Uh, and there are some barriers to accessibility and everything, but um, but it's getting a lot better. And then when you don't have internet access, as I say, you kind of have a supercomputer in your pocket anyway, so you know you can do lots of things offline. Um, and that's obviously just going to get easier and easier. So the kind of evolution of all of this technology has meant that we kind of now need to design and build our databases to work seamlessly across all devices. So that's not just desktops, phones and tablets, obviously, but kind of looking to the future, wearable computing, augmented reality headsets for long kind of virtual reality environments. So anything which we build now in terms of archaeological databases, we do need to have an eye to how, these, how that data would be consumed and viewed in the future as well. Um, <coughs> so for us, that actually meant a kind of radical reworking of the back end of, of ARC. Um, and so version 2, has we, we had to figure out ways for um, remote devices to basically sync back offline and everything, because as we know on archaeological sites, you might be down in the basement or you might be spread out across a huge archaeological site, you might not have internet access, etc. Uh, so we needed to kind of find the, the I guess the digital equivalent of someone running across the site with a context register or something like that. Um, and that is actually harder than it sounds, but um, hopefully we're, we're kind of getting there. Uh, back to 2007 again. So Web 2.0 was a huge buzzword. Um, not so much anymore. Uh, and this one was actually how we did it in 2007. We managed to write a plugin for Blogger to um, to plug in ARC data straight into a, into a blog. Um, this has obviously become a lot more easy now, uh, and now we talk about linked data and APIs and everything. Um, uh, does everyone know what an API is? Sort of, no. Application Programming Interface? I don't even know what it stands for, but basically it's a way of getting, <laughs> getting computers to talk to each other, so it's computer-to-computer -computer <laughs> communication, really. And we... APIs and linked data are such a massive thing that you don't really notice anymore. So on your Facebook feed, YouTube or whatever would be firing in a YouTube video into your Facebook feed, or, and you don't even notice that that's actually these two two uh, softwares talking to each other. Uh, so that is now what, the way we have to have to deal with it. Um, and what that means for us is actually it's actually quite good because um, oh, is that actually changing? Oh animated, right? Um, <laughs> I didn't realize it did that anyway. What, we, what that means for us is that we can also pull in data into other programs quite easily. So this is a, um, we wrote some Python plugins for QGIS, which linked directly to the ARC database. And this was actually really to kind of radically speed up our data creation. So talking again about this hybrid paper digital aspect, when we come out of the field, you have a whole bunch of square parametrase sheets, um, and someone has to sit there and digitize them to get them into the digital thing. Someone has to geo-reference them, etc., etc. Um, 
But what we were able to do was write some plugins into QGIS. Uh, what we were able to do is write some plugins into QGIS so that um, uh, it would automatically georeference each of the permatraces to the sheet, and then a lot of really nice, re really nice digitizing tools to make sure you get the right line types and everything's attributed correctly with the right context and section numbers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But also you can uh, click on one of the things in QGIS and it will give you all of the data from the ARC database directly into QGIS so it's not um, not just reading out of the attribute table of the shapefile, it's actually linking directly out to your data. Uh, these tools are freely available as well. Um, you can download them if you like on our QGIS repository there. Um, you don't have to have an ARC server to, to use them so I thoroughly recommend having a look at them. Uh, and in fact, I think Guy might have them on his computer, so maybe if anyone's interested, he can give you a one-on-one -on -one live demo, maybe not in front of everyone. Um, so very quickly, just talking about standards and standards. So in 2000, uh, oh, that's actually, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we, how we preserve the, um, the actual database itself. So this is quite important where if you think about um, databases, uh, sorry, websites now are very, very dynamic. How do, you actually, how do you actually archive a dynamic website when you can basically choose to write whatever you want into Google or something and get back whatever results you want? It's very, very difficult to, to uh, accurately archive what, what uh, the website actually looks like. And we had a big problem with this recently where we actually had to basically run through all of the queries which had been run on our website and output each of those pages to a static HTML page in order to, in order to kind of archive our dynamic website. So it's a bit of a problem. Um, but this is where the standards come in. And in 2007, there was a lot of argument about standards. 2017, there's still a lot of argument about standards. But I think everyone's moving in the same direction now. Um, and ARC itself has a a back end where we'll be able to um, basically have a one stop. You press the button and it will set, put your ARC database into the format ready to go for some of these repositories. We've had a chat with Open Context and TDAR, it's hoping to catch up with the ADS today. So it's not going to be directly deposited, but it will hopefully put it in the right spreadsheet format or what have you um, in order to get it straight into one of these repositories. Theoretically, one click, no hassle. We'll see. Um, and then finally, oh, I've got time, hopefully. Um, this is the WordPress front page from 2007. Um, so this is, I wanted to talk a little bit about software as a service, which is something which has changed a lot recently. So back in 2007, Software as a service, what that basically means is cloud computing. So you could sign up to WordPress in 2007, only if you were already hit, obviously. Um, uh, and then they would host your blog for you, and everything would be done on their servers. Now, previously with, with Arc, you have to buy your own server, maintain your own server. You have to download the data. You have to have someone who can configure it. You have to have someone who can kind of... Um, uh, sort all of that out for you. But now people are really used to this software as a service. People have their email on Gmail, people have their photos on Flickr, probably still, I don't know, maybe they've moved somewhere else now, Facebook, etc. Um, <coughs> and so what we really wanted to do was make Arc as easy as possible, as easy as one of these services here. Um, so we have set up a service called Arc as a service at the moment, but we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, where you don't need a server, to, you don't need to install your own server or anything like that. We'll have a server that you can set up, and basically, it worked like Dropbox or WordPress, where you simply sign up online, you can configure a complete Arc within, let's say, five minutes, saying what kind of recording system you're using, if there's any extra, extra, um, fields you want to do and what have you. Uh, then you press the button, five minutes later you'll have a fully um, fully working recording with post excavation database, fully functioning web app, uh, and the phone app that you can download. Um, 
and also of course uh, full access to the QGIS tools as well so theoretically it should be a, a one-stop shop um, just removing those kind of barriers to entry basically and making archaeological recording quite simple and easy to do we're, we're going to be launching this in early to mid-summer it's almost early summer so let's say mid-summer now <laughs> but if anyone's actually interested in becoming a kind of early adopter or a beta tester please do get in touch because we would really really appreciate some feedback on on the service and everything uh, we're left with one thing to do which is thinking of a decent name and this is quite difficult so we so far we've come up with Arc as a service which spells arse. <laughs> the arc service, the arse. Arc service online, arsehole, that's even worse. Arc service now always like Arsenal. So, anyone got any suggestions for what we should call it? Uh, that's it, thank you very much.